sing to God be the glory, to God be the glory. Yeah. 
says this, wherefore, in verse number 11, comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as also you do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in, their lo in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. You know, one thing the scripture teaches us to do is to honor those that labor in the ministry of God's word. James says that many shouldn't desire to be masters or teachers of the word of God because there's such a higher standard and judgment, the Bible says, about those that minister the word of God. And um, You know, I appreciate Brother Travis. I appreciate God using him and how God's blessed his life and called him and put him in the ministry, counted him faithful. And, um, and I've watched him over the past couple, three years, going on, I guess, in my third year. And uh, just watch how he studied the Word of God, sought to be true to the Word of God. And um, that's a blessing. You would think that that would be the norm. Um, but it's the exception in the day and hour that we live. And I appreciate Brother Travis and appreciate how God's using him. And so I, I, uh, I honor him as a brother in the Lord and as a preacher of the gospel. And so um, tonight I'm going to give him this time for the preaching hour and uh, let him give us the word of God tonight. So you pray for our brother as he comes tonight to preach to us. Brother Travis, love you in the Lord and I appreciate you, brother. You come on and preach to us. All right. All right. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful singing, too. Uh, singing is just not a filler. Singing is an act of worship. It's us offering praise to the Lord. The Bible says he gives us a new song. They put a new song in our mouth. 
Lord, it, it tells us many times throughout the Psalms. The Psalms is a book of Psalms. Yes. Yes. Don't ever take lightly. You know, you could say no. You don't have to say it. You could say no. <coughs> You're not forced. Really not even expected, though we take it for granted. Thank you for the wonderful saints. Yes, amen. May God bless you. For those that listen, boy, it's an act of worship. It's a wonderful time of praise to the Lord. Those songs stir me. I'm so glad that he sees what we don't. I asked him to sing that song. It's a special song. Now, today we're going to look at a message about uh, a lady who used to see things and how God changed her life. And how God's changed mine and your life. And how he's made a difference in our life. I want to say thank you, Pastor John, for the opportunity to preach. Uh, Y'all know it's the plan that he was supposed to go uh, away with his wife for the book thing. Uh, and he wasn't able to. So, of course, he asked me to fill in his stead. And when it come down that John David was sick, um, he still allowed me to preach today. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, don't pass it. It's his pulpit. It's an honor to share the word with you. Amen. And I pray that tonight's message won't be grievous to you as we look at who we once was and that we're no longer that anymore. Some of us may be lost in this crowd and who you once was is still who you are today. I would hope and I pray that the majority here on a Sunday night is of those that have made a profession, repented of sin, and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And you know that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're a new creature in Christ. I would hope that'd be the case. If that's your testimony today, you're no longer who you once was. So why so often do we live like it? If I can... We'll look in Acts chapter 16. We're going to look at a fortune teller who met Jesus. Amen. Now she met Jesus through some preachers. Yeah. Jesus in his physical form is not here tonight. But I assure you as much as I know my name that I know it's been written in the Lamb's book of life. And if the Bible is true that I believe wholeheartedly, then he is living in me tonight. And he's living in each and every one of you, which gives us the power in order to walk word, the vocation wherewith we're called. In order for us to honor Christ in our life, you can walk in the new creature that you are. You can put away this old life that you no longer are and live in the new because of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, amen. And I'm no Paul and I'm no Silas. I'm no Timothy and I'm no Luke. But the same God in them is in me tonight. Yes, Whether we like it to believe it or not. And it's in you. Yes, amen. And that power had enough power to change this woman's entire career. Her entire I'm so glad he sees what we don't. And this woman would use her crystal ball, if I may. Probably not really, but she was a woman of spirits. And the men gained from her soothsaying. The Bible word, if we look it up, is a word that means ventriloquist. And we know that a ventriloquist was someone that you put a fake doll on their lap, right? And you talk and act like that doll's laughing. It's very funny. I know. I enjoy those shows, if you will. That Bible words is a ventriloquist. So I looked up what a ventriloquist was. And it says it's a person who's able to utter sayings to where the hearer would not know where they come from. This woman had a demon. This woman had an old life. I venture to say I had a demon prior to Christ. And when he moved in, the devil moved out. Amen. And this woman would speak of another voice 
would speak of another time. She would look into her ball of fortune and fame and the past and the present and the future and tell all of the masters what they may gain from <laughs> until the messenger showed up and it changed her life. Look with me, if you will, in Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 18. I would ask you to listen in, but there won't be a whole lot of thinking tonight. You'd be able to hear the word plainly, I believe. I pray that the demon be binded, if there be one in the midst. I hope I don't scare you. The Bible says, and it came to pass, as we went to prayer, the lady Lydia, the seller of purple, now she'd already have been saved, and she allowed the men to come live in her house. And so they went to prayer, and a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, and if you look at that divination, is where we'll find that ventriloquist, she met us, which brought her masters much gain by her soothsay. What's that? Her fortune teller. The same, that woman followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which she was true, she's been honored which show us unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, he sensed there was a different spirit in the room. He sensed there was a different spirit in this lady. Much of life wants there was a different spirit in you. Wants to summon this crowd, no doubt, that spirit is still there. He being grieved turned and said to the spirit, little s, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out the same hour. Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you so much. I thank you and praise you for who you are and what you've done. Jesus, I pray, Lord, if there be any demonic forces, Lord, that would try to uh, confuse or try to bind the word from being spilled out tonight, Lord, and placed on the table. And I pray, Lord, that there'll be nothing in the way, Lord, that you make it easy to preach and you make it even easier to listen, Lord. I pray that you would for us that are following the Lord. Help us to be reminded of what you did for us, that the change was real, and give us strength to continue on in this new life. Lord, every day we must crucify our flesh. It's not an easy task, and I pray that I don't preach like it is, Lord, but I pray that you'd help us by the power of the Holy Ghost, Lord, that you've given us to comfort us on, on these weary travelers along the way, Lord. I pray that you would comfort us tonight, remind us of where we was, Lord, and remind us there's a future coming, and help us to live the new changed life. In this day, if there be any lost here tonight, Lord. Lord, if you give me liberty, I'll allow them to come an opportunity to pray. And Lord Jesus, I pray if there be any lost, they'd be saved today. If there any demonic holds on anybody, Lord, I pray that you release them in the name of Jesus. Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the glory and honor. For us who's worthy of. In your name, amen. What we see here that this woman had a different life. She had was different than what most people even were. She was possessed, no doubt, the Bible says. And we see here that she had a job. And her job was to tell all those masters, you know, uh, the future and to help them out. Who knows what all they inquired of her. And I wanted to look at something here. That when she met Jesus uh, through those men, she was a fortune teller no more. When that spirit come out of her, all that nonsense come to a halt. All of that stopped. We know that as we read farther in the text. Because now this was the very act that got Paul and Silas thrown in the prison where we love to shout and holler and preach about them singing in the 
prison and the shackles falling loose and the walls crumbling down and the soldier coming with repentance ready to kill himself that they may leave and he says what must I do to be saved and they let him on to his house saved his entire household then they go back to the prison and then they said let him go they said no we're going to sit to the prison here until they those leaders come and let us out themselves this is the same story prior to that. This is the act that they captured Paul and Silas and put them in prison because they released this demonic power from this woman, gave her Jesus Christ in this stead, and the men now lose out on all the gain from this woman's fortune telling, and they were so mad about it, they threw them in the jail. No doubt she was changed. If she was still the same as she would have been, then I had no reason to handcuff her. Then I had no reason to put him in jail. Then I had no reason to do anything different. No doubt the change was real. She is a fortune teller no more. And I don't know what life in the past you've come from. Some was saved at a young age. They don't even know all this life of ungodliness. But if we're really careful, we can expect and inspect our lives and see where we've fallen short from the glory of God and where he's made up all the difference. That ought to happen to everybody. There'll be a day and hour one time when my son is going to have to come to the reality of whether he got saved at six years old in my truck or he did not. You say, well, how do you know if he's really going to be saved or not? Because the Bible says that he gave him power to be a witness. And there'll be a decision in his life one time where he'll have to decide, am I going to be what God called me to be or am I not? You say, well, how does he get to make the decision? Because if he's really born again, the power of the Holy Ghost will make him a witness and he'll have no other choice. There was a day and hour every voice in here ought to know the day that you realize Maybe not the day you got saved, maybe necessarily. But there ought to be a day when you realize what Christ done for you and that the old life has gone away and done with you. And that happened to this woman. And it changed her life completely. And the men that helped her go to prison. When a person gets changed by Christ, they're not in the same business that they've always been in. It's impossible for us to claim that we know Jesus and still been in the same ridiculous, lost, and ungodly state that we used to be in. Amen. It's impossible. The prodigal that we heard about this morning had no business in the hog pen. He had no business. His place was not in the hog pen. This was the father's son. His place was at the father's house, at the father's table, with the father's ring and the father's robe. And we saw that that came to be true later on in the story. He had no reason to be, no business in the hall pen, and you don't need yes, Is it true that you can stop and turn around now? Yes, and I pray that we all do. Yes, amen. That's what I told the pastor this morning. I said, man, what, a, what, a, what an illustration that, look, regardless of how far we're going, well, we're not in the hall pen yet. You can always turn around and come back. Look, I don't know about you, but I was in the hall pen, but I was lost and undone. Yeah. I didn't even know what the Father's house looked like. I didn't know what a meal felt like. I didn't, I didn't know what a first love was. I didn't even have him. But now that I know it, I'm always ready yes, to be filled by the Lord's table. How is your appetite? How is your appetite for the Lord? Have you lost your first love? My son loves steak. My wife loves shrimp. They love them a whole lot better because I can't get for them all the time. So when they get it, one ain't even mine. <laughs> and if you'd ask me what's the first thing you know really loves to eat, I say he loves that. Oftentimes when he comes up to the table, is he ready to eat? Is he ready? How's your appetite? Because the food we're talking about tonight is none other than Jesus Christ. And he's all of our first love. And he's prepared a table now here for us tonight. He's prepared a table and allowed us an opportunity to eat from God's word. Don't lose your first look. Just grab and growl, as they say. Number one, we see this fortune telling tells a lot of, and I don't know, some of y'all been to one, y'all know y'all have been. Some of y'all been to a palm reader. Some of y'all been to a spook. Well, some, huh? That, yeah. Come on. Yeah. Somebody played that. What's that game called?
called Brother Ben. I know you another woman with the Ouija board. Look, don't you? I have another yeah, question. Okay. Okay. Do the Ouija, is it a Ouija? Yeah, oh, one or two. The Ouija, I'm sorry. Look, I ain't not have really had to play that game. I was I had a lot to you. I was too scared to play that game. I was. I like this thing full of talk. Because I believe demons was real. I did. I thought, well, it's going to tell me the future. Well, this fortune telling did a lot of that stuff. Look, if some of y'all been there, or at least heard somebody that did, go and go figure out what the signs can say. Well, this woman could do it. She could do that. Yeah. One thing we see here about this change is, you know, them fortune tellers can tell you who and where you've been. Yeah. You know, they got to prove who they are, right? Yeah, that's right. They got to prove that the future, because you can't see the future, but you know where you've been. Yeah. You know your past, right? You, you know all that. So if they tell you where you live at or where you was born and, and, and what the date was and all that stuff and, and all that, well, you'd be like, man, that, this might be for real. Yeah. They might have got some inside scoop on them. Isn't it funny that you call you got to make an appointment? <laughs> they find a whole lot out about you from the Google. I'm just throwing that out there, okay? <laughs> but somebody come and tell me of a great story and what they told you. But I can find out a whole lot. I found out too, you just pay a little bit of money, you can find out all kinds of stuff on people. <laughs> so you want to come, and, 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 and I, might, I might spend a little bit of money. So if you want to know about yourself, you come on back and talk to me. i tell you some things you probably didn't know you did. Yeah. <laughs> but they tell you the past. Look, and just let me, let me say this very quickly. Uh, for those that live in the past, look, I'm thankful that God now uses my life experiences yeah. in order to help somebody else. Yeah. But I wasn't gaining experience in my life. The truth about my past was that I was lost and undone. And I was no good without Christ. That's the reality. Some of us say, well, i got to live a little bit so I can get some experiences. No, let me say this. The experiences of the walk with God has done a whole lot more in my life than the experiences walking without God. And the experiences that I've been walking with God have taught me a whole lot more than the experiences I learned without God. God. Let me say this, when you was in your past and you was thinking you was learning how to live and you was learning how to go and you was, you was trying to figure out life and you was becoming wise and, and learning for yourself what was good and what was bad, no friend, you was surviving and it wasn't but by the grace of an almighty God that he didn't stop you in your tracks but that you didn't go head all along over a cliff somewhere and that's the reality of our past. We was lost and undone and God knew all the while where you was. God knew all the while what you was doing. God knew all the while where you been and what you used to do the whole while. But you're not a fortune teller no more. And I don't know what past each of us come from. We'll let you no longer live in that life. But that's the old life. That's how you used to be. That's how it used to, uh, uh, used to was. And you was always being used to the world. You know, it's amazing to me. Oftentimes when we get us a good job, we figure out we're being a benefit to society. When we got a good job, we feel like we're really making a difference. And I, I'm not down to a good job. I, I wish all of you could have uh, what you would be considered a good job. I know that some probably might not even like it. Maybe it's a, a step to somewhere else. I, I don't know, but we all wish we could have that. You know, she probably really thought that I've really got it figured out because all the masters, all the teachers, all the high-end people really love me and use me all the time. When in reality, all they was using was the benefit she was bringing. She had no idea what life she was living in, and I didn't either. My past, I had no idea the consequences of my sin. I had no idea the, the damage, the collateral damage within my home and household. You know, the Bible tells of your beginning. In the song, it says he knows the end from the beginning. Look, they didn't need a soothsayer to tell them about the beginning. The Bible says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Now, I don't know how good of a soothsayer you've seen before, but can't none of them tell you about you before you got here. You say, well, she had power. She probably really did. Yes, she had demonic power. You say, well, there ain't none that don't have some demonic power. You might have went to one, maybe they did. Maybe they did have some power. Maybe there was demons that told them some things. I'm not saying they're all hocus pocus. I'm just telling you there is a reality in between the difference between darkness and light. And there is a spiritual warfare going on at this very moment all around. Now, there's more with us than there are with them, praise the Lord. But they ain't none of them tell you 
about you before you got here. Say Jesus. And Jesus said, I knew who you was long before you even started this thing. I knew where you come from long before you made a mess of it. I knew where you was going to be. I knew you and I had a plan for you. He said, I sanctified uh, 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 you. He knew and had a plan for you. He wasn't just by happenstance. Either. God knew you before and he knows what you've been up to. Some of you may have been saved and you're still living what you used to live in. And to be that you all know that it ain't right. But yet we still want to live in the same past. She was a fortune teller no more. Whatever you was, that ain't you no more. If you've been born again, you're not in the same business that you used to be in. God knew, don't live in the past. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind. Look, and that's good and bad experiences too. Why? We can't change the past. Even the things we've done for Christ, don't live there, reach for the new. Reach forward to something new. Don't live in the past. Whether you're living in guilt or whether you're still doing it, don't live in the past. He saved you from that. He changed you from that. He knows where you've been. He knows what you've been up to. He said, forgetting those things and reaching forward to the things which are before. You know, the Lord should have forgotten all about us. You know, the Lord should have forgotten about that old fortune teller in Philippi. He should have forgot about her. What was the point in saving her? What, what does it matter to help her? She's doing her thing. Let's leave her alone. And she's possessed even. Let's leave her alone. You know, the reality is, how come God moved an entire world just to meet you? How come he moved an entire world just to come to where you was? I'm sure I'm glad he didn't say, well, he won't make no dent in society. Well, he, they're just old West Virginia folk. They're not going to change nothing. I had a guy from another state just tell me the other day, seems like West Virginia. I don't know where that. Stores is closed. People's buttoned up. Ain't much going on down here. Trying to figure out some things to do for some things. There's not much going on. Why you just forget about us? We're not doing nothing. Why well, just forget about us? We're just living our own lives, doing our own things. I'm glad he didn't forget about me. Yeah. You ought to be glad he didn't forget about you. Yeah. Look, he knew where you was and what you've been up to, and he still does. But you've been changed. Number two, not only did he know about the past, a lot of times in fortune tells they tell you where you are. They might tell you your name, or who your friends are, who you're married to. You know, Jesus knows right where you are. So he knows who you used to be. Some of you still are. You haven't been saved yet. This is the message to believers. Some of you believers, he says, well, I know where you was, and you're still there. He says, I, I know what I saved you from, but yet you're still living where I saved you from. I have a question, where are you? Where are you? Are you where you used to be, or are you where God puts you? Are you who you used to be, or are you God's put you? Have you been changed? Because this woman was changed completely. She wasn't the same as she used to be. If you'd have went to her and tell her, tell us, tell us again. Tell, tell me where I'll be tomorrow, she wouldn't have been able to say. The change was so real that the masters was upset about it. They said, you've taken away our gift. You've taken away her gift. He said, yeah, I changed her. Is there somebody here tonight that you can't tell the difference between the way you used to live and you are now? Is there somebody here tonight that knows you ought to be living and walking with the Lord, but you're still stuck in how you used to be? He knows. Her inside was far from God. That woman was far from God on the inside, regardless of what it looked like on the outside. But she looked really good to them. They really enjoyed her abilities and powers. Until it was taken away. Her insides were far from God. Have you been changed? I'm just asking the question. Have you been changed? 
Do you have a form of godliness, the Bible says, but deny the power thereof? Are we a lover of our own pleasure, or are we a lover of God? Do you remember where you was and, 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 and who you were when God came to you? I'll never forget. You know, this woman, I wonder if she ever thought, is this the way life's supposed to be? You know, I wonder if that woman ever thought, this is it, this is my life, and I enjoy it. Or I wonder if she was haunted by that day. I wonder if she was haunted by that life. I wonder if every time they came to her, praising her for her uh, ability, that she thought, I don't have anything and no purpose. I wonder if she was haunted by nobody cares about me in Philippi. I wonder if she was haunted thinking, I'm all alone. They just use me and they just want me for what I bring and they just call on me when they need me. And I wonder if her life was upside down and wondered if there was anyone that loved her. I wonder if there was anyone that cared about her. I remember, and I was able to share my testimony just the other night with some people. And I remember when my life was upside down. And I thought, nobody can love me. Nobody cares about me. I have no purpose. I'm tormented for nothing. All this is for nothing. I'll never make a change. I'll never do nothing in my life. And I didn't even know why I felt like that. You know, I wonder if she thought that. You know, that she had no idea God was sending Jesus her way by the boys that turned the world upside down. Them same men was the ones that they said, here they come, the ones that turned the world upside down because they was offering Jesus to people that did not have him. And as they accepted Jesus, it changed them. The reason that the world was upside down is because a change was occurring in the world. And that change didn't happen as a whole of creation. That change happened in here, friends. And it happened in there, friends. And it happened inside of you. And the change that was wrought by Jesus Christ that caused those men to be able to turn the world upside down was the change of the comforter, the Holy Ghost of God, being implanted into a believer's life that caused them immediately to tell fortunes no more, that caused them immediately to change of their old ways, to change of their old business, and become what God had for them. Could you imagine what she thought? Them boys, if you read in your Bible, they come all the way from Derby, then they went to Lystra, then they went to Phagia, then they went to Galatia, then they went to Mysia, then they went to Troash, then they went to Samothracia, then they went to Neapolis, and then they ended up in Philippi, just to end up in this lady's back door to change her life. And I don't know about you, but I'll never forget that God stopped all of eternity, it felt like, that he stopped the entire world, it felt like, and changed my life one day. That he come all the way to Charleston, that he followed me all the way to South Carolina, that he followed me all the way uh, to New Bern, North Carolina, that he followed me all the way to Pensacola, that he followed me all the way to Washington, State, then he followed me all the way back uh, to South Carolina, all the way to Japan, carried me all the way to the middle of the ocean on a boat in the middle of nowhere to fly me all the way back to South Carolina, back to Charleston, then to Dunbar, and back here to Charleston, and saved me in my bedroom at 1706 Dudley Drive. Now I don't know about you, but in the middle of my nobody loved me, God sure went a whole lot of places in order to come find me. No different than he did for her. In the middle of all of that, those men bounced from place to place offering Jesus Christ, and they ended up at her front door and saved her life. i never forget where I am and that Jesus found me right where I was. Yes, and look, the change was so real that I've never been the way that I was. Now, we may have slid, there may be sin here and there. Look, I've never had the desires that I used to have ever in my life. And I can't even litter without it bothering me. Matter of fact, I took the boys on my way here to the right aid, to the Walgreens, because they wanted sugary sour candy. So I took them to get sugary sour candy. On my way out, I had some wrappers from these little mints in my pocket. I stick my hand in my pocket to put the chain she gave me in and pull my keys out. And I think, I think, honestly, one of them rappers come out of my pocket that's been bothering me ever since. I, 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 I wish I'd take out the line. I think one of them rappers come out. 
But I was in such a hurry to get here because the girls wanted to sing. I was already running late, and I just let it slip my mind, and I cannot stop thinking about it. I thought about this whole time. Look, I'm not perfect. I'm just telling you that I ain't the same as I once was. I used to take beer cans and throw them off signs as I drove by. Now I can't even let a litter come out. That didn't bother me. The boys built a tower out there in the parking lot. If you go look at it, it's a wonderful thing. So I met Tammy and Dave Booth, and I think they was building the Tower of Babel. Is that right? Well, you know, for decoration, John David Nuno put a mask on top of it. I just want to make sure that rock pile stays safe. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled in here this morning. I had that old trailer with that full on. I just had time to take it off. So I backed in right up alongside that rock thing today. When I pulled off, the mask had blown off the towel. I went over to pick that mask up. It was trapped. Uno said, that's a decoration to go on top of the rock wall. Took that mask, I put it back on top of that rock wall like it was. Why? It ought not to be trapped. Now, it serves a purpose there for their tower. I'm here to tell you that I'm not the same as I used to be. My world has been turned upside down. They didn't turn it upside down just because they was hooting and hollering. They didn't turn the world upside down just because they knew how to pray a little bit. They didn't turn the world upside down because they just was different than everybody else. No, they turned the world upside down because what they offered changed people's lives. And he changed me. I pray to God that he changed you. And if he did come to where you want, look, some of y'all been a lot more places than I have. George been all the way to Korea. God was hunting him down. But some of y'all been all kinds of places and lived all kinds of places and God knew right where you was when he saved you. Never forget it. When he saved you, if you believe it, there's a miracle change took place. And we're no longer what we used to be when he found us. Everything he touches changes. Everything that Jesus touches changes. Everything. One lady just grabbed the hem of his garment. Changed. Everything God does changes us. And if we have been changed, why are we still living like we have? Look, I know we battle the flesh and carnality. I know that. And I, I know that, 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 that we have to deny ourselves daily. But why aren't we? Praise the Lord. Testimony after testimony. God save me. Let's live in that changed life. This woman didn't go back to her old job. The master didn't go and give her a different job. That was done with her. She couldn't go back even if she tried. The demon was gone. When Jesus moved in, the demons moved out. And her ability to be evil was no longer there. Her ability to be evil, no longer there. She's a new creature. She'd been changed. She'd been changed. Have you been changed? Have you been changed? Are you different than what you used to be? Not because you choose to, because the power of Christ in you. If any man be in Christ, the Bible says he's a new creature. The Bible says, examine yourselves. Let me read. Examine yourselves, and you can do this. This is how, just so you know, I'll share this with you. This is how I realized that in 2011, I didn't rededicate. I really got saved. Now, I learned that through my Bible reading. And my faith in him. I used to always ask myself, preacher you could even attest to it, I would ask you sometimes. I used to inquire, how do I know whether I was saved or did I get rededicated? Was I saved before? Because I was raised in it. I remember 13 years old, I went up and said some words at a, at a 95 FYC youth camp, you know, and, and I went up front when everybody else did, but I never felt no different. I, it's not all about feeling, but I had no different desire. I had no change. I was still the same kid that I always was. And the first time that I was introduced to alcohol, I took it. And the first time I was introduced to secrets, I took it. And the first time I was introduced to women, I took it. And the first time I was introduced to drugs, I took it. All the while praying at night that everything would be all right. I was blind. By God's grace, I teach my teenagers now, don't be blind. Thinking you was something and you ain't. Is there a change in your life? That change is desire for Christ. That change made us different and it turns the world upside down. The Bible says this is a verse that helped me to realize he really born me again. 
It says, examine yourself. This would be good for all of us. Yeah. Whether ye be in the faith. You can go on and do it now, if you please. He said, prune your own selves. Then he says, know ye not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in, is in you? Except you be reprobate. That reprobate is counterfeit, bud. That's a hypocrite. That's counterfeit. Not the real thing. Not the real deal. Let me tell you, this woman wasn't a fortune teller no more. This woman's life was changed. She was not in the same business that she was always in. And I've come to tell you today, if you have been born again, then you can examine yourself, see if you be of Jesus Christ, and you'll know whether or not he's in you or not. And if there's any doubt, you ought to be on this altar before I even get finished with this point. If there's any doubt, run to this altar before I'm even done. And if you know for sure, then live in that new life. In everything. Shut the TV off. Turn the music channel. Put down the booze. Look, the peace of God, you can't find no bottle or no pill. Put down the things of this world and accept the change that God gives you. And he's blessed us so richly. You know, Jesus is the greatest gift, but some of us eat pretty well. Some of us sleep pretty well. Some of us drive pretty well. Some of us live pretty well. But we don't want to give him but just a little bit of our time on Sundays and Wednesdays. And can care less how it works out the rest of the week. This woman's life was changed completely. She wasn't who she used to be. Jesus came a long way to save and change us. I'm just saying why I live like it. Fortune teller no more. There's some of you don't have a lot of big past to say, well, he saved me from this. Well, if he give you the desire to avoid that, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Number three. Your future. Not in the same business no more. They're not a fortune teller no more. They'll tell you about your future all in all. Who are you inside determines where you're going. Who you are on the inside determines where you're going. Don't get it twisted into believing that if you just follow the guidebook and just hang in there for a little while longer and live a certain way, dress a certain way, well, if I just avoid the few things that he said, then I make it into glory. What's inside of us determines where we're going. That inside's got to be filled with the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. Jesus Christ living inside of you. And I am so glad, as the song said, that he sees what we don't. Where are you going? You know, here was a question I asked myself, and I thought this was pretty important. Where does your neighbor say you're going? Yeah, I think if I asked you most of the time, you'd say, yeah, we're going to heaven. Praise the Lord. I hope that we all. I hope all of us. Who's your neighbor say you are? Where's he say you're going? If we went and interviewed the neighbor, because if we went and interviewed the masters here, in verse 19, it says, when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rules, eventually in the prison. Look, she was changed. And they knew it. If I went to the masters and asked them, what do you think about the fortune teller? They say, she ain't no fortune teller no more. They say, she ain't the same no more. She's different than what she used to be. Would your neighbor, if we had the opportunity to inquire of them, what about your co-worker? If I asked your co-worker, where do you believe that, that my brother and my sister's going, what would they tell you? Would they say, well, I don't know. That's up to him and him over. Will they know who you love? And will they know who you serve? Will they know who's changed your life? Let me ask this. When you get around those that haven't been saved, does everything seem to turn upside down? It doesn't seem odd when you're around them. Sometimes it does as believers. We can't fit in. We can't do how they do, how they act. Most of them really don't call us much, or they definitely don't call us on off hours because they know you're not going to hang out with them. I remember when I was in the trenches of the railroad, and when I started on the railroad, you know, I might have done some things that didn't really portray Christ. I remember I was down in the dishes. We had to dig up this. We used to splice cable together. 
and you splice it. Uh, you used to splice cable together, and then we put this plastic thing around it, and then you poured this liquid that you mixed together down in that splice key. And the plastic piece you put around it would hold all that liquid in together. And after a few hours, that thick stuff would harden up in there. And it gets so hard that you can't penetrate it. Water don't penetrate, dirt don't penetrate, and it keeps the splice of that cable together. Well, we had a bad one. Some of the metal was touching each other, and some of the wires were shortened out. It was causing a problem. Ground them really each to each other. So we had to dig that old one up. I just tell you so you have a better picture of what's going on. I got moved to a different gang, and this gang maybe didn't know who I was and how I was. Maybe. They didn't know that I had just gotten saved so, and all of that. So we're down in this ditch, and the foreman said that was so mad. That was one of the hardest jobs. Because to dig it up after it's already, well, you dig up the wrong places, you tear the cable again, and you're making more trouble than you was to work, work with, and then you really don't know if that's even where the problem is. But you know you splice cable there. And every connection is a possible failure. Isn't that right, brother sister? So we dig it up. Everybody's upset. I said, well, I can't wait to get some beer tonight. I can't wait to hit up the hotel bar tonight. Well, I'm just working, doing away. And that guy said, you go with us, Travis. Well, I had to make a decision. Now, mind you, uh, for 20 years of my life, I said, yeah. Now I'm faced for the first time when a big crowd wants to hit up the bar. What I'm going to do. I said, not me, buddy. I ain't going. I said, well, I said, I ain't know what else to say. I just kind of laughed it off in the moment. Not me, buddy. I ain't going. He's like, what? Blankety blank, what? Blankety blank, blank, dang, you're the party man. I said, well, you know, I tell Joe Stair too, right? I sing all the time. If you swing a hammer, I'll be singing. <laughs> you know? They said, no, you got to go. I said, well, why? I can't go. I, I can't do that. No more. I used to. I don't do that. No more. What's wrong with you? Well, I don't know. Well, Jesus, you know, I love him. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like, I don't know what he's going to say. He's going to beat me dead down in his home, bury me, put me on the splice, hold the wires apart, you know? <laughs> Look, there was a change that happened. I mean, like, I ain't saying I've always walked the line, you know? But you ain't going to find me in the same place I used to be by God's grace. The reason I know that because Christ lives in me. I don't feel like grieving him. I don't feel like quenching him. You know, quench means to suck, to smother him, to put him out. And the Holy Ghost is a fire. God is a consuming fire. But I don't want to smother him. I want him to burn brighter in me. I want him to burn brighter in me. And the Bible says, let your light so shine before me. And I ask you, who would your neighbor say that you love? Look, I'm not saying that you don't need this change life. If you do, praise God. But let it be a reminder when it comes calling, because it will. Let it be a reminder when it knocks on your door and asks you to change. Asks you to do things that they're not doing. God not doing. God not doing. I remember when I tried to quit smoking cigarettes. Didn't find it about me. Oh, my dad smoked his whole life. I believe he's in heaven. I ain't smoking. He might be singing. He might be shouting. He might be talking. He might be telling stories the way he used to, but I can't find them. He might find a lake to fish on. I don't know what I want to bring. He might sit and pray to Jesus all day long. He might walk. He might talk. He might run. I know he ain't got his body yet. I know he's in his spiritual body. He waits back to come across him out of prayer. I get that. But he ain't smoking. Just tell me. It was hard when I quit. You know what I did? I quit buying. It cost too much anyway. But I quit buying. So then everybody be smoking, and I'd be like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be real, right? And I'm like, you know, like, what's wrong with you? You want cigarettes? You know, like, what? What? No, no. Yeah, I, I mean, if, yeah, if you give me one, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. So I wouldn't buy them, though, so I wouldn't have them. When they get started, every now I take them. I spoke a little, and then, you know what? When I got done with that cigarette, you get that little nicotine, you know, some of y'all know, good back all that stuff, I get all that. But, you know, that wasn't called preaching in any, you know, God changed me. Sanctified, sanctification is what we call it. It's just making me more like him. 
Well, I started to realize when, when we were at the smoke pit, smoke got the military, but you know, the place where it's designated to smoke cigarettes. You know, when you're at the smoke pit, you kind of just talking about whatever they talk about and doing whatever they doing. And it really ain't a good testimony for me to tell them I can't drink with you at the bar, but yet I have to smoke a cigarette. It's just not a good testimony when I tell them, hey, God will change your life. <laughs> well, it's good. Uh, uh, you hold it long as you can until you get lightheaded. Well, some of y'all cigarettes smoking is what I'm talking about. <laughs> Every time I'd get done with one and put it out, I'd be like, why'd I smoke that cigarette? You know, once I got my fix, yeah. look, we fix it with liquor, we fix it with pornography, we fix it with dope, we fix it with pills, and once we get it, we're like, oh, why'd I do that? I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. It's the same way when you say something you shouldn't be saying, right? You get caught gossiping around the corner, and then a lady comes by and says, I thought you was my only friend. You say, man, I wish I wouldn't have said that. You know, that helped me to get off them cigarettes. I said, look, I'm not helping myself, and I'm not helping the testimony of Jesus. Look at that son that may, and you may go into praise. Well, my, my daddy, I get it. But I desired to have Jesus more than I did them cigarettes. And I think it's a level of change in all of us, but if we allow him to do it, he'll make you different. If we allow him to do it, he'll teach us different. If we allow him to do it, he'll show us different. You know why a lot of us take out off bad habits? Because we ain't asking to do it. The demons still hang around. We ain't asking to do it. Don't live with the same demons that you were saved from. The change was evident in her life. When Christ went in, the demons had to leave. Let your light show signs. You know, I had to call some preachers while back now, and I had to repent for abusing my Christian liberty. There's a thing called Christian liberty. You may have learned Sunday school one time. But I had to repent of my Christian liberty, how I abused it. It just didn't sit well with me. It didn't sit right. And I told the Lord I ought not to be acting like that either. The Lord said, well, there's some other brothers that know how you act. There's some other brothers that know what you done. And I said, well, am I going to live in the changed life or not? So here's where I get my opportunity to deny myself and crucify my flesh. You know, I called them brothers. You know, most of them say, well, you ain't got to call me. It ain't no big deal. I hear you. Nah, whatever, you know. I said, no, friend, that, that wasn't me. And it, it was sure wasn't Christ. And the Bible said that he changed me. I just want to let you know I got caught living in that old life. You know, I got caught a little too loose, and, and that just ain't me. I, I don't want to apologize. Because one day you might decide it's all right for you to abuse that Christian liberty because me, I just can't have that. I call them to apologize. If you have Christ, start living like it. It's very easy. Can't find peace anywhere else but Jesus Christ. We're finishing up here. You know, there's really no fake it to make. Like we say, well, make it till you make it. No, friend. Look, a last point's your future. If Jesus is, that's the question. Does Jesus live inside of you? Do you know him? And the power of his resurrection. Do you know Jesus Christ? Does he live in you? And if so, when he moves in, all the other stuff moves out. It says the old man's passed away. Behold, everything becomes new. You be in Christ, you're a new creature. That's a new creation. You're totally new. Does Christ live in you? Because there's no fake it till you make it. One day you're going to be standing in front of Jesus. He's going to ask you about it all. If there's nobody in there with the same nature as who's up there, you'd be living down there. Say, yeah, but, but I went to church. I, I prophesied in your name. I, I did all of these things. Are you kidding me? I gave religiously. And he said, depart from me. I never knew you. You were with other Israel. Depart from me. There was no change in you. There was no Christ in you. You say, well, my goodness, you're trying to get me changed. Yes, I am. I want you to honor Christ. And if you can't honor Christ, maybe there's no Christ in there. 
and you need him to come live in you so that you'd be a new creature. There's no place to make it. You know, just because you fit in doesn't mean you belong. Just because you fit in don't mean you belong. You know, there's a story of this man and this woman, this elderly man and woman. You know, and the husband was dying. He was bad off. He wasn't doing very well at all. I think they may have had him in hospice and this and that. Definitely had him at the doctor, you know. Of course, wife would come by often as she could, of course, and spend time with him and live with him and stay there with him in his last days and bring him changes of clothes take care of him, comb his hair probably, make sure he was doing all right for the best he could. That man ended up passing away. When they come in there, they, they gathered all of this stuff together. I don't know if you've ever been around when somebody died and they'll them out, but it don't take long. I remember I was at the hospice house with my dad. And it don't take them too long to show up. They'll come to the back door and they do it all the best they can. And if you're curious like me, you want to hang around all the time until you're sick in your stomach, but just keep Hanging in anyway. You know, this lady probably did the same thing like that. She just wanted to hang around. She knows it's time to go. You know, there's peace and hope when somebody passes you know in Christ. And I made it happen for her. I don't know. But, you know, they get up all his stuff and they send him on out the back door, come up with a blanket. It's time to go get dressed up for the funeral. You know? So they, what's that called? Mortician and all that? They didn't want to dress y'all up. So they take him on into the mortician. He gets to looking at what's going on there and everything in the house laid out. He's his job to pull everything back together, make them look that way they You know, they embalm them, they do all that stuff, you know. And uh, I don't know if you ever seen him, you know, but all the skin will go south. Everything goes cold, you know, that's part of it. You know, they ain't just with them right in there for you to look at. There's a lot of work to be done. You know, they got to do makeup, they got to do their hair, they get to put the clothes on, all this stuff. Well, they got to have teeth in there. If not, it's rough to look at, you know. And they live, some of them say they sew their lips together or they glue them and all this and that. I don't know much about it. You know, well, they gathered up all that guy stuff and took them on down there to the shop. And they dressed them up and get them all ready. And the wife's at home, you know, she kind of, oh, she's probably thinking, yeah, I'm ready to go to, you know. It's about my time, you know. I can't believe all this happened. Well, she noticed that his teeth were still laying there beside the bed. You know, just because you fit in don't mean you belong. But you can belong. Just because you fit don't mean you belong. So anyway, she noticed that his teeth were still laying there. She goes, oh my goodness, I've been around a long time. I know how this goes. They're going to need to put them teeth in there. Well, the whole time, the guy's working away and doing his job. He's, he's having the time. He's fixing this. He's pulling that. He's poking this and prodding that. Lifting up this and folding that and putting it here. Putting it there. He takes some lift. He shoves some teeth in there and glues some shut and zips some red. And man, he looks good to go. She calls down. She said, hey, I, I don't know if y'all got started or not, and I don't know how much you got going on there, but I still got his teeth there, and you're going to need him to put him in here. She'll make him look halfway decent. I got his teeth there at the house. He said, well, ma'am, I done put a set of teeth in there. She goes, "Them's my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> they was gathering up everybody's stuff, grabbed her teeth, and shoved them in his mouth. Look, they fit in there, but they ain't belong. <laughs> Look, just because you fit in don't mean you belong. And there's only one way to be sure, and that's to make sure Jesus Christ lives inside of you. Yeah. Now, I don't know what she did. I seriously doubt they peeled them back out of there and she took them home, put them in the cleaner, and put them on. <laughs> but they fit in there, and they did the job, but they didn't belong. I'm asking you today if you've been changed. Because the Bible says the miracle takes place the day of salvation. The Bible says that you're no longer who you was, and now you live living the newness of life in Jesus Christ. You know, there's a verse in Proverbs that says, look, it's an abomination for the wicked to be justified and for the just to be condemned. You know, that verse is saying, look, how can God call you righteous if you're really not? And how can he call me wicked when I've been made righteous in Christ? That means a miracle took place. Pastor preached that a long time ago about that verse. Here's what I'm asking you today. You're no longer who you once was. She was no longer a fortune teller. You're no longer who you was. Let's just stop living like you. 
Because here's the reality. We keep saying end times are coming. God's coming back. And that may be true. There's a lot of times that it's true. Are you turning the world upside down? The only way you turn the world upside down is to be changed in something new. My crystal ball here, we can do a whole lot with that. Eventually, just like that old man, you're going to slip off into eternity. That's what they say, right? You're going to slip off into eternity. If your fortune's in here, you probably will. But if your, for if your for future's on the rock, there's no slip. Death's not a place you slip off into the grave if you're on the rock. The Bible says, lead me to a rock of China. He said, on this rock I will build my church. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ found in his word. You don't have to slip off into eternity to stand on the rock. If you've been born again, then just walk in the newness of life. You don't have to be how you used to was. Hey, let your light so shine before men. Somebody's going to ask you one day who you are and who you know. And I pray that you'll live it to change their life. Don't just fit in. Belong. Allow God to change your life. Can we sing that song one more time? Can we sing that song and then let the pastor close us out? Now, if you want to pray during this song, you can. Uh, if you need saved, you can. But look, God come to save us. We're not who we once was. He saw what we did. You know, that soothsayer, you would have thought, would have known Christ is coming. You would have thought, you would have known, she knew it was coming to an end. He saw what she did and saved her life for it and changed it completely. And he saw who you was. Now he sees who you are. Now that's new life. I'm glad he saw what he did. Because I'd be in hell, I believe, today if he didn't save me. He sees the sun through the 
still working on you. Amen? And so uh, thank you for that good message tonight. If you need to be saved, trust in Jesus. Amen? Good song. Great song. Thank y'all for singing that. Let's have a word of prayer, then we'll be dismissed. I think they finished up over there, and I think these, can you take these two young ladies with you? Awesome. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time tonight. We thank you so much for the message, God, that reminds us of the power of the gospel in our life. Thank you, God, that you know all things, Lord, and help us God, help us to follow you, God. You have the keys to every door. God, you are the map for every uh, course that we take. God, help us to trust you when we can't see the way. We love you tonight. In Jesus we pray. Amen and amen.